far we've looked at the way that the body compensates for low levels of oxygen, for hypoxemia and hypoxia. And of course it's essential that we recognise when our patients are hypoxic so we can correct that. And there's two ways we can recognise the clinical features of hypoxia, or two groups of features we can recognise really. The first one we've mentioned which is the body's compensatory mechanisms, so we look out for those, we look out for the tachycardia, we look out for the tachypnea of course. But as well as, as, well as that, there are consequences of hypoxia. Now these consequences aren't compensatory mechanisms, they are just things that happen in the body as a result of the hypoxia. And perhaps the best known one is cyanosis. Now cyanosis describes the bluish tinted discoloration that we see in skin and we see in mucous membranes. Now cyanosis is fairly easy to recognise in white people. You can see it in the skin, you can see it through the white skin. In people with darker skins, it takes a little more training and we have to look at things like the fingernail beds. Are they pink or are they cyanosed? The colour of the lips, the colour of the mucous membranes, the colour of the tongue. All these things are very indicative and you'll get the same sort of cyanosing effect in these areas in black people as opposed to white people. Now, when does cyanosis present? What does cyanosis mean? Well, what a lot of people don't realise when they're students is that cyanosis is actually already fairly serious. It's already a fairly late clinical pathological feature. Now, when you're monitoring patients' oxygen saturations, some patients will become cyanosed when the saturations are 85. Others might show cyanosis with oxygen saturations as high as 88. So we're talking about 80, 85 to 88 percent saturations is when a patient starts to become cyanosis. Cyanosed. After that, they'll become progressively more cyanosed, of course, as the oxygen saturations drop. And that's equivalent to blood gas partial pressure of oxygen of about 8 kilopascals, which is 60 millilitres of mercury. And of course, as the partial pressures of oxygen drop lower, we would expect the cyanosis to become more pronounced. Now, why do people become cyanosed? Well, as you know, there's two forms of haemoglobin in the blood. Oxyhemoglobin is full of oxygen. Deoxyhemoglobin, or reduced haemoglobin, is haemoglobin without oxygen. So deoxyhemoglobin and reduced haemoglobin mean the same thing. And of course, oxyhemoglobin, the blood is bright red. It's a bright red pigment. And deoxyhemoglobin, it's a dark red pigment. This is how we differentiate between arterial and venous bleeding in the systemic circulation. Arterial bleeding, the blood is bright red. Venous bleeding, the blood is dark red. And when the blood is, the dark, when the dark red blood is seen through the skin or seen through the mucous membranes, the combination of the light reflecting on the dark red blood, reflecting through the mucous membranes, makes it look purple to the human eye. So it's kind of, it's kind of a bit of a trick really. The blood's not really purple, the blood's really dark red. So when you see purple through skin or through mucous membranes, what you're actually seeing is the dark red discoloration of blood which is rich in deoxy or reduced haemoglobin. And scientifically you get a cyanosis when there's about 5 grams of reduced haemoglobin or more, more uh, per 100 mils of blood. And it's caused by the presence of the deoxyhemoglobin in the tissues. So when you see that, you know the patient's oxygen levels have already dropped quite significantly and it's time to do something about it. So we're talking about consequences of hypoxia. Still clinical features, still things we need to recognise, but things that happen as a consequence of the hypoxia, not things that happen as the body's, as the body's attempted compensation for the hypoxia. Now it's useful to be able to distinguish between peripheral cyanosis and central cyanosis. Now peripheral cyanosis is observed in the peripheries of the body. So maybe the toes, 
the fingers, the ears, the, the tip of the nose. And you can get peripheral cyanosis with reduced levels of circulation. Now what happens here is that the blood is in a capillary for a long period of time because the circulation is reduced for whatever reason. It may just be because that the patient's very cold and they're peripherally shut down. So if you think about the, uh, the wall of the capillary there, and the red cells going through it, if the red cells are going through it very slowly, they have time to give up all of their oxygen to the surrounding tissue cells. That means they become very deoxygenated because they've had a long time in the periphery to give up their oxygen. So sluggish circulation, as might occur in heart failure or even when someone is very cold, that can cause cyanosis as well. In fact, we say that people are blue with the cold. That's what we mean. The peripheries are so shut down, blood is travelling through it so slowly that they have time to develop peripheral cyanosis. Central cyanosis, however, is a much more serious clinical feature and indicates an acute hypoxemia if someone is centrally cyanosed. And centrally cyanosed in white people, we can see it in the neck, in the, in the chest, and in someone of any colour, you can see it in the lips and the tongue. The tongue is a very good indicator. So if you're thinking your patient might be cyanosed, ask them to put the tongue out and look at the colour of their tongue. If their tongue is cyanosed, that is central cyanosis, and that means that patient is definitely acutely hypoxemic and needs to be managed acutely as a, an immediate uh, intervention requirement. The brain, of course, is dependent on a constant supply of oxygen for its normal function. So remember way back at the start of this video, we talked about J.S. Haldane. What did he say? He was talking about the brain primarily, and he said oxygen lack not only stops the machine, but will go on to wreck the machinery. So it stops the machine. It stops normal neurological function. Without a constant supply of oxygen, the brain won't work properly. And we can assess patients with this, for this in different ways. You could do a simple AVPU. Is the patient alert? Do they respond to your voice? Do they respond to pain? Or are they unresponsive? More accurately, of course, we could do a Glasgow Coma Scale estimation. But what does this mean in terms of hypoxia? Well, when oxygen levels drop below 85% saturations, then the patient's going to start to have mental impairment. When they go below 75% oxygen saturations, there's going to be severe mental impairment. The brain will just not be able to work in oxygen saturations of 75%. And you can't put a hard figure on this, but most patients will have a very low level of consciousness or indeed be unconscious with oxygen saturations of about 65%. And certainly by the time you get to oxygen saturations below that, around about the 60% level, you'd expect nearly all patients to, to be unconscious with that level of oxygen saturations. And these patients, of course, even with mild hypoxia, can be very agitated and they're quite hard work to look after. They're always taking the oxygen mask off or thrashing around and it's a constant effort to say, keep your oxygen mask on, keep your oxygen mask on. You always need to special these patients to make sure that they're receiving their oxygenation. Quite a good uh, management challenge. You need to be quite patient with these patients. So in mild hypoxia, depressed mental function. This was first discovered actually in, in uh, early, the early days of aviation. They found out that when pilots went up to more than 10,000 feet, that their judgment became impaired and they could start to become irrational. And you get the same with mountaineers today. They can make very irrational judgments because of the the hypoxia. And it's the same with our patients, that they become irrational. There's depressed mental function, there's impaired judgment. Irritability, as we said, trying to take the mask off or even pulling out the lines, there can be a real management challenge to these patients. Restlessness, confusion, lethargy, even excitement, almost paradoxical behaviour. They can complain of headaches, they can feel nauseated, dizziness, vomiting and fatigue all possible manifestations of mild cerebral hypoxia. And then as the cerebral hypoxia becomes more pronounced, 
These patients also have, a, in addition to all those features, which become more severe, they have dull sensitivity to pain as well. Uh, they can't feel pain normally with more severe hypoxia. But then when hypoxia gets very severe, you've got possible convulsions. Fitting. Now, fitting can occur any time there is an insult to the central nervous system. So if the brain becomes acutely hypoperfused, there can be fitting. For example, if a patient faints and they're still propped up, that exacerbates the degree of the cerebral hypoperfusion. The neurons become hypoxic and they can start fitting. That's why it's so important to lie people down when they faint, so that you don't get this exacerbation of the acute embarrassment of the cerebral neurons. And it's the same with hypoxia. The hypoxia, the hypoxia is an insult to the brain and that, and that can cause fitting. Grand mal type convulsions. And of course these can be reversed when you give the patient lots of oxygen. Eventually, as we've said, of course, they'll be unconscious, they'll be comatosed. And of course, death is, is a consequence of hypoxia. Now, if you're in an airliner and there's a sudden decompression, of course, airliner cabins are normally pressurised, but if a window breaks and there's a decompression and all the air goes out, there'll be an absolutely sudden drop in the partial pressure of oxygen. Now, the partial pressure of oxygen in the air at sea level is about 160 millimetres of mercury. And this could drop to anything as low as 20 millimetres of mercury at 16,000 metres of altitude. So basically what this means is that the oxygen goes from adequate levels to basically just about nothing. And if the oxygen levels drop that dramatically, loss of consciousness occurs in about 20 seconds. This is why in an airliner they say if you've got children with you, put your own oxygen mask on first and then put the child's oxygen mask on second. Because if you don't put yours on first, you might be already unconscious after 20 seconds and unable to help the child. Death will occur four or five minutes later. Now, if you hold your breath, of course, it's going to take longer than 20 seconds for you to become unconscious. That's because there's a lot of oxygen in your lungs, retained in your lungs. But if you're breathing in and out with air, which has got a very low partial pressure of oxygen, you'll lose that oxygen and you become unconscious in about 20 seconds. And this, in my experience, is about the same as the amount of time it takes to become unconscious if the circulation stops in a cardiac arrest situation. It can take a little time for the patient to become unconscious because the brain is able to use a few seconds worth of oxygen in the brain cells and in the blood in the brain, but that's quickly used up and the patient becomes unconscious within about 20 seconds because there's no circulation of new oxygen. And the, the situation is probably fairly similar when someone faints. You, you feel yourself going faint, you feel yourself going dizzy, and then you lose consciousness because the circulation is reduced. And in about 20 seconds, you've used up all the oxygen in the brain cells and you become unconscious. And in a way, this is a great thing because it means that people can be in absolutely horrible, painful, excruciating situations, and yet they become unconscious relatively quickly. Even when you become unconscious, of course, you'll keep on breathing. Because the brain cells which give rise to consciousness are smaller than those which give rise to respiratory patterns. And therefore, the brain cells are larger, they hold more oxygen. So a human being can become unconscious after about 20 seconds of severe hypoxia, but can carry on breathing. But that's the situation which happens if there's an absolutely sudden, acute withdrawal of the oxygen that's available to the brain. Of course, hypoxia is going to have an effect on the skeletal muscles. These require a supply of oxygen in order to generate energy. Having said that, skeletal muscles have a very significant anaerobic capacity. They can work without oxygen for quite a long time. 
But eventually, especially in chronic hypoxia, there's going to be a reduced work capacity of the muscles. The person is going to feel tired and weary because the muscles aren't going to be able to work properly. And there'll be extreme muscle fatigue. We see this especially if there's reduced circulation to the legs in peripheral vascular disease. And of course, in intermi intermittent claudication, you get the buildup of lactic acid, which can also cause pain. And patients who are hypoxic often get this, one of these common abbreviations, short of breath on exertion. When they exert themselves, they become short of breath. Now, the heart of an actively metabolising muscle. So there's going to be cardiac effects of hypoxia. And as we've seen, the compensatory effect is, is tachycardia. Sometimes in children, after there's been a tachycardic response, as they decompensate, they will actually become bradycardic. Now, if you see a child becoming bradycardic, that is an absolute medical emergency. A child who is bradycardic is probably about to die unless you intervene in fairly dramatic ways. But what I've seen in the, in the intensive care situation in patients that are hypoxic, or very hypoxic, is that there's a tachycardia, of course, but then what you start seeing on the monitor is you start seeing a lot of ventricular ectopics. You start getting an, an erratic activity in the ventricles. And this, of course, makes perfect sense, because as you get reduced levels of oxygen in the ventricles, the myocardium becomes irritable, and you start getting ectopic focuses, abnormal electrical activity, and that can cause abnormal ventricular contraction. And then eventually, of course, if the hypoxia to the myocardium is prolonged, they will become, they'll go into ventricular fibrillation. This is, this is what I've seen in, in severe hypoxia. Uncorrected ventricular fibrillation, of course, is a terminal condition. So anyone who's hypoxic, get a cardiac monitor on them, make sure the heart is working okay. If it's going too fast, they need more oxygen. If a child becomes bradycardic, that's in a medical emergency. If an adult goes, it starts getting a lot of ectopics or goes into ventricular fibrillation, of course, that, that is a cardiac arrest situation. And in fact, people dying of acute hypoxia, what most people will actually die of is ventricular fibrillation. The heart will become too embarrassed, and instead of having a nice coordinated contraction, it will just fibrillate. And so the cause of death in many acute hypoxic situations is actually cardiac arrest. Now, the last consequence of hypoxia I'm going to talk about, again, it's well-known, well-known complication, cerebral edema. Collection of fluid within the cranial cavity, giving rise to a raised intracranial pressure. Now, when the brain becomes hypoxic, there's going to be a reflex vasodilation. That's going to increase the permeability of the capillaries and more fluid from the plasma is going to go into the interstitial spaces, giving rise to cerebral edema. That's sometimes called vasogenic cerebral edema. It comes from the vasodilation of the blood vessels. The other thought is, is cellular cerebral edema. And in cel cellular edema, what happens is the cell is low on energy. Therefore, it can't pump the sodium out as efficiently as it did. That means the sodium is retained in the cytosol of the cell. Sodium is, of course, osmotic, so water is drawn into the cell and the cell will swell. Vasogenic cellular edema, so-called cytotoxic cerebral edema. Both will increase the intracranial pressure. And normally, of course, there's blood vessels going through the brain, taking the blood from the large arteries to the capillaries where it's needed. But because these blood vessels are intracranial, there's going to be pressure on these blood vessels. So the raised intracranial pressure there, as a result of the hypoxia, 
the hypoxia causing vasogenic and cytotoxic cerebral edema, that pressure is going to close down on the blood vessels. The pressure on the blood vessels is going to reduce the movement in the blood vessel. That means less blood is going to get to the brain, to the metabolizing neurons. So the cerebral edema is going to cause a cerebral ischemia. And after a severe hypoxic episode, very often the patient will be left unconscious as a result of this. And we have to look after these patients very carefully, full care of the unconscious patient, preventing the complications of immobility, making sure their airway, airway's okay, making sure their breathing okay, making sure their circulation's okay, giving them fluids or nutrition as appropriate. And then we review these patients after 24 or 48 hours, or even longer. Only then will we know whether the reduced level of consciousness is caused by a transient rise in intracranial pressure causing cerebral ischemia or whether unfortunately permanent brain damage has occurred as a result of the hypoxic episode. But I've certainly seen many patients who are unconscious for a few days, they come round and make fairly full recoveries, returning to good qualities of life. So always give these patients the benefit of the doubt. Look after them carefully while they're unconscious and hopefully they'll recover and they'll be appreciative of what you've done.